God bless you. I want to take a moment just to tell you how grateful I am to get to be with you this evening. I want to tell you how much I love this church and how much I love what it is you as a body of believers are doing, not just in this community, but around the world. I want to thank you for blessing me and my family over the years that we've been associated with you. Now, we're going to talk about some things tonight that I think are extraordinarily important for all of us because it is faith, John says, that allows us to overcome the world. In 1 John chapter 5, John says, It is your faith, even your faith. And that faith, of course, being in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But it is specifically your faith, my faith, our faith, that overcomes the world. That's an amazing statement. And we're going to talk tonight about what that looks like and some of the things that uh, we find as we explore our walk with God and look at others and their faith. I want to begin by talking about an experience uh, of Abraham's in Genesis chapter 18. He's arguing with God, well, He's having a discussion with God, going back and forth about, and, and he's trying to whittle God down on the number of people he has to find in order to spare Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's trying to get God's number down lower and lower and lower. And finally, Abraham thinks he's got God kind of cornered here because he's, he's been working him down on the number. And finally, toward the end of the discussion, Abraham throws out the lowest number. And he says, he asks a rhetorical question that is extraordinarily important for all of us. The rhetorical question he asks, and that is, he knows the answer before he asks it. The rhetorical question he asks is, will not the judge of all the earth do right. <laughs> of course he knew the answer was yes. Just like you and I know that. But I want to tell you something tonight. That, that, that question and that truth, because it is a question that is stating a truth, because it's a rhetorical question, we know the answer. That statement says multitudes about what we're talking about with regard to faith. Implied in that statement is that God, the Creator, the Judge of all the earth, has always done right. And we trust that the Judge of all the earth has, and right now, is doing right. That means no matter what it looks like to you or to me, what my particular experience in life is right at this moment, that I can trust that the judge of all the earth is still doing right. Oh, that's powerful. That's important. And you and I can look to the future and know that the judge of all the earth will do right. When Paul, at the end of his life, says this, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep all these things I've committed, all these, all these experiences in, 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 uh, of my life, the beatings and the 
and the tortures and all the other things I've been through, I've committed to him against that day. I know that the judge of all the earth, he knew that the judge of all the earth is going to do right. And that there was a crown of righteousness laid up, not just for him, but for all those who long for his appearing. Why? Because the judge of all the earth has always done right. The judge of all the earth is doing right right now. Even in the midst of my brokenness, even in the midst of my tragedy, even in the midst of whatever it is that I wrestle with. Paul said at one point in his life that outwardly we're wasting away, but inwardly we're being renewed. I've come to experience that in my life over the last several years. But you know what? The judge of all the earth is still doing right on behalf of all of his creation. And we need to remember that. We need to remember when John told us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What John actually says there is for God so loved the cosmos. That's the word there. It's translated world. It's the Greek word cosmos. So whatever God is doing, whatever God has set out and purpose to do, Paul says, before the foundation of the earth, with regard to redeeming and reclaiming and reconciling man to himself, he's doing on behalf of the whole cosmos. I want to talk about a few things with regard to faith that I think are important. Faith can be and should be transcendent. And what do I mean by that? Your faith and my faith should be able to transcend the circumstances and the situations and help us deal with and not just deal with but thrive in the midst of those kinds of exchanges of life and passages. That doesn't mean we don't feel pain. That doesn't mean we don't feel excruciating pain. That doesn't mean we don't grieve loss. But it does mean that because of our trust and faith and hope that Jesus is exactly who he said he was and that he is living and breathing and resurrected and still alive and well and coming again, we know that the best is yet to come. Something that I've learned over the last few years and it struck me, very important to my heart, that no matter what day, what kind of day you're having, whether it's the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, for those of us who are trusting that the judge of all the earth is doing right best day or worst day of our life guess, listen to this the best is yet to come don't forget that I don't care what kind of day you're having if it's the best if you're at Disney World and everything all the lines are empty and you get to run from thing to thing to thing or whatever it is you love to do whatever it is that would say Oh, this is the best day. Just remember, ah, the best is yet to come. Now, all these things are very important. Isn't it interesting that Paul in Romans chapter 1 uh, says, verse 17, that the righteous will be justified by faith. He's actually quoting Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. Faith is essential in our walk with God and in our relationship to the world around us. 
And the righteous will be justified by faith on both sides of the cross. Abraham, justified by faith. Uh, Ed Moser, justified by faith. Uh, and all of that faith comes to fruition when Jesus does what he does to redeem and reconcile us. And so we trust, once again, that the judge of all the earth is doing right. But our faith, your faith and mine, has to be instructed and shaped. It needs to be instructed and shaped by God's Word. It needs to be shaped and instructed, our faith, by the author and perfecter of our faith. Christ, first and foremost, that is what shapes and molds our faith. If our faith doesn't look like the Jesus of the Gospels, uh, we need to rethink our faith. If our doctrine and dogma in the church doesn't look like the Jesus of the Gospels, then we need to rethink what we're doing corporately with regard to our faith. Our faith is informed by our experiences as well. You know, when you're younger, uh, you think you know a lot. But it's funny, as you get older, you realize you didn't know as much as you thought you did. Why is that? It's because experience has taught you that. And if, you're, if our faith and my faith and, and all of it together is informed by the gospel and the spirit of Jesus through the word of God, and we know Jesus from the word and what we see around us in life, guess what? That's going to change our perspective. And now faith will begin itself to change how we see things, how we feel things, how we interact with the world around us and with each other. Paul says uh, to the church of Corinth, we used to view each other from a worldly point of view, but we can't do that anymore. Why? Because we believe that Christ is exactly who he said he was. And that's changed everything. It ought to change how we move in the world. Faith that doesn't change us is really not faith at all. We're told by James that the devils, you, you believe in one God, that's good. You believe there's a God, the devils believe that and tremble. Well, what's the difference? That faith has not moved them to worship and honor God. They have a mental assent that there is a God. But it's not changed and molded their lives. Faith sees the invisible. Faith believes the incredible. And faith receives and does the impossible. The scriptures are full of it. Everywhere you turn. Somebody's going to be talking before long about Hebrews 11. And, and in chapter 11, verse 1, faith itself is defined not as a substance, not as a, an ethereal, uh, mystical thing. He says, your faith. The idea there is defined by people's faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. The substance of things not seen. I'm sorry, let's reverse that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's talking about your faith and my faith. How do I know that? He goes on through the whole chapter there to talk about individuals and their faith and what 
was accomplished through them as a result of their faith. Now, what is, is faith always a big, are we talking about big, hairy, greasy faith that makes you a hero and everybody's like, of course not. What did Jesus say about mustard seeds? All you need is a little bit of faith. Use what you have. And know that God is every bit as concerned with the mundane as he is with the majestic. He's concerned about the moment, not just the epic moments but the quiet moments when we are with one, another one or some body who is broken and hurt and we say something that helps that we pray something that helps that is faith that makes a difference in the world I want to take a break just for a second, because these are these are big things we're talking about here. Let's have a moment of joy, okay? Four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around ten o'clock tonight. But it's that right, so join me home. Have some fun when the bright strikes. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. We're gonna rock, rock, rock. Joy. I, I love things that just bring me to pure joy. That's one of them. Our faith ought to bring us to joy. Our faith ought to bring us to each other. Our faith, as it's instructed and shaped by the Christ and by the God of love, who is always doing right. It changes us and it changes how we move in the world and how we react and interact with each other. It should change every aspect of us. And as we grow and learn and as we move through the different passages of life, where our faith is continually being shaped and molded and instructed by our experiences and those that we, uh, those difficult times we go through. We're always learning and, and always being uh, moved in our faith uh, toward Him who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Look at what faith has done in the world. Look just in your scriptures. The, 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 the proverb writer says, commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. That crazy Noah did. And he spent 120 years building a boat on dry land. And man was delivered. That crazy Moses trusted God with his speech impediment and all. And he went and faced down the greatest power of his time. And Israel was freed. Job. Job sitting on his pile of ashes. Being drilled by his friends. And even his wife. Why don't you curse God and die? In faith he holds on. He transcends his situation. And he says. No. Oh, I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm not sure about what's going on around me and to me, 
But I know the judge of all the earth, and the judge of all the earth does right. He showed us a new face of God. And John the Baptist, he trusted. And you know what? He lived out there in the wilderness wearing crazy clothes and eating locusts. But you know what he got? He got to baptize Jesus. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. We are shaped and molded by what we believe. And when we believe what John is talking about with regard to Jesus being the Son of God, when that becomes reality to us, and we know that to be true. We are forever changed. And we are forever being changed. We are forever moving differently in the world. Or we should be. And we should be aware of it. We should be aware of what we say and how it sounds to people who are broken or searching or wondering if faith, genuine faith really does exist. Uh, I've seen some of our Facebook accounts. I'm going to quit preaching here and start to meddle a little bit. I wonder sometimes if our faith and the fact that that faith is centered and built on Jesus and who he was, if that faith is informing our Facebook posts. Okay, I'll stop about that. But just know that somebody is watching you and looking to you and wondering, is there a good word? Is there a truth that matters? And you may be the only person that is able to communicate or have that moment with that person. And so we need to uh, take our faith and purposefully move in the world in a way that lifts those we talk to. In a way that lets them know God has always, always been on your side. God wants you to know him and to know how much he loves and desires you and to what lengths he's gone for you to be reunited with him and by doing so guess what everywhere faith goes it leaves prints I have faith prints all over my life and my heart I close my eyes, and I don't even have to do that, but I close my eyes, and I think about people in the past, in my life, from all walks of life, but people of faith who left their faith prints in my life. Some of them were West Texas cotton farmers. Some of them, some of them were ministers. But some of them were little elderly ladies. Some of them were street people who had faith. Some of them 
struggled every day to just put their feet on the floor and face another day. What remarkable heroic faith. And those people have left faith prints on my heart and help shape and mold my faith and point me to the character and the joy and the sweetness there is in Christ for whom everything was created and by whom everything is sustained. And guess what? Here's the best part of this is you and I are leaving faith prints on somebody's life. Faith prints that matter, that will help shape their thinking about what God is and what Jesus is and who they are in respect to their lives. What kind of faith prints are we leaving with the people and loved ones? and family around us? Will it be something that helps? Is it something that reminds them of the love of God? I sure hope it is. I want you to just think for a moment. This makes a difference. This matters. If you ever wonder about what you're doing in the world, if it matters, you close your eyes and you think about all the people in your life. You couldn't begin to complete the list but all the people in your world who, has left, who have left faith prints on your heart and in your life and know that you get the chance and are doing that right now. And we as a collective body of Christ are supposed to be doing that for the world and telling them, hey, God purpose before the foundation of the earth to love you, to redeem you, to rescue you. And he did it at a cost of becoming one of us and dying a horrible death, but to rescue you and I from our own rebellion and our own disease. Ah. Oh. Faith Prince. Yes. May God bless you and keep you. And may His face smile upon you. And we know that He's always gracious unto all of His creation. God bless you.